folks uh, mingling in the back, if you could just start finding your way to a seat. Um, good morning, everyone. Wonderful to see all of you. I'm glad you all voted with your feet and decided to come back. <laughs> um, uh, if we didn't meet yesterday, I'm G. Kim, and I'll be emceeing this morning. Uh, as a reminder, uh, our day two objective, day one was really just about getting a lot of ideas, inspiration, dreams out there, digging really deep into some of these topics, uh, and it felt like it was a graduate seminar in many ways on six different um, disciplines. Uh, today, uh, we're going to turn our attention to concrete things that we can work on together how ideas can become action, uh, both within the particular areas and projects that we care about, but also potentially across uh, projects and areas uh, that we care about. So there's no better uh, crew to kind of start this conversation than the folks who will begin uh, our dialogue um, here. So just to give you a sense of the structure, we'll spend about 30 or 40 minutes in a dialogue, and then we'll turn to a fishbowl structure where Folks can jump in, uh, ask a question into the empty seat, or if you're feeling aggressive, you can tap someone out of the circle and take their spot. <laughs> uh -oh. American Gladiator. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. I'm, I'm, I'm taking bets. This is called Fantasy Fishbowl <laughs> on who lasts, basically, at the end. <laughs> um, Survivor. Um, so anyway, let me start with some introductions. Derek Hamilton uh, is a professor of the New School and the founding director of the Institute on Race, Power, and Political Economy. He has been involved in crafting policy proposals such as baby bonds and a federal jobs guarantee, which has inspired legislative proposals at the federal, state, and local levels. He has advised multiple elected officials, and was a surrogate advisor for the Bernie Sanders presidential campaign. Welcome, Derek. Uh, next, we have Erica Smiley, is the executive director of Jobs with Justice. A longtime organizer and movement leader, Smiley's work focuses on building power for working people through collective bargaining as one way of advancing democracy while, recruit, while reducing inequality. Smiley recently co-authored an excellent book, the Future We Need, Organizing for Economic Democracy in the 21st Century. Thank you, Smiley. And finally, we have Saki Bailey, the Executive Director of the San Francisco Community Land Trust. Saki holds a JD and a PhD in Law and Legal Theory. Her research focuses on the legal regulation around community land trusts, co-op formation, and incorporation. Saki is a licensed attorney and advocates for policies which advance community land trusts and other shared equity housing Thanks for coming, Saki. So uh, first I just thought I'd start with reactions, highlights, questions. What's resonating? What's sitting with you from day one? So maybe I'll start with you, Smiley, if that's all right? Sure, yeah. All right. Um, I have a lot of reflections from yesterday. So um, I did not uh, come here feeling like an expert on property at all. And uh, uh, so really came with a pretty open mind and was really interested in learning how this might connect to the work and the framework that I'm used to living in, which is uh, organizing collective bargaining for workers and for others who are kind of trying to negotiate their economic frameworks. And so uh, the first thing that I was compelled by was the discussion yesterday around uh, just like the different applications of, of property as a framework for defining uh, relationships. Um, both as a power dynamic um, or better yet like a rationale for control. So there was the discussion that Damon gave of property as, a, as applied to workers, especially for me, I was thinking about uh, particularly the most extreme case of as applied to say enslaved workers to justify uh, power, decision making, uh, control, exploitation of labor. There was a discussion that uh, Ramsey and Mary and others gave around uh, the framework of property is applied to land, nature to justify and power and control exploitation of natural resources and or space to kind of basically rent, to kind of extract money for rent. 
Um, to hear his framework of property is applied to brands or even like words uh, to <laughs> extract rents and royalties and the kind of speculative value. All of that was really interesting to me. Um, but then, like, I think at the end of the day, yeah, the second half, I was really both struggling, but then kind of uh, also really excited by, or I guess agitated by, the fact that I couldn't apply the same framework as well to um, some of the discussion on data and information. And uh, what's his name? Jer is it Jaron? Is that your name? Your Shrek. What did you say? Shrek. Shrek, yeah. yeah. Your presentation, I was just like, poor guy. I like, kind of started chasing him around for like half the day. And I was like, your presentation, I was like, most concise. But then I was also like, let's all understand what we're doing. Uh, so I was like, his workshop, and then also like kind of figure it out, uh, because like unlike unlike land and people and words, you know, like it's not the data and information; it's not scarce, right? And it's you know AI is still kind of the wild wild west, right? There's so much of it, and it's available to be accessed and commodified in some way, at least up to the point where, as we've seen historically, where until capital can begin, begin to consolidate it in the hands of a select few, as it's, as it's kind of designed to do. And then, you know, it can be manufactured into a sense of scarcity, and then the value can be inflated, yada, yada. And so what was really interesting, and I kind of really sat with it for the rest of the day to some degree, what was really interesting about that conversation to me was this sense that um, I think Mark and, and Damon kind of helped me understand it in the context of like a of his historical materialism, like, you know, this is a, they call it a compression point of like, you know, how, how like there was a point where songs could only be written down with notation and then there was a mechanical recording and how did you copyright that? And then, then there was digital recordings and how do you copyright that? Like, I know at least a few of us remember the Napster Wars, you know, <laughs> I say Napster. <laughs> okay. Uh, and then, right, and then there's, you know, th then now there's AI or whatever. And so, uh, and like, maybe like this is a moment where we could be getting in front of it uh, to some degree in front of that that fight and that there could be a way of like negotiating the use before some of that gets commodified and stuff and so all of that is to say like I was I was really really intrigued by that because I certain my work right I know that many working people are already negotiating over uh, data and AI and things and this idea that uh, there are moments where the framework of property, uh, at least tactically, could be used in a way uh, to, to, to stop exploitation on the front end, uh, given our current frameworks, right? I mean, certainly, I think Damon's saying, you know, John Locke clearly got it wrong. We can all agree that uh, property is a framework to base society off of, is exploitative, extractive, all the things. And given the society, you know, we're products of our, of our situation, the society that we live in, we could also use the master's tools to potentially break it up. And so that was kind of the polarity that I was left sitting in yesterday at the end of the day. Right, smiling. Uh, Derek or Saki, do you want to add anything to that? Yeah, I think similar to Smiley, um, the theme that kept coming back for me is, you know, property is a social relation. It's not a thing, it's not a relationship to things, it's a relationship to each other about those things. And I thought, so beautiful to open with Ramsey Tom talking about, you know, the ha and the V and the E, which is the relation between the ha and the V, the, v, the water and the breath. And really, I think that's, that is what, property is about as an institution. It's really about our relationship to each other, about the resources. And then it's about how fundamental those resources are to our life and to our flourishing. Um, and I, I don't take it for granted to start in a group where people embrace that idea of property because I've been a legal scholar <laughs> in other contexts where you know neoformalism is still asserts itself. And so to even start with that point, and also to hear Damon yesterday talking about the uh, fundamental breakthroughs of American legal realism um, and this kind of more purposive turn and the turn to you know, thinking about the way in which private property is a handmaiden for the market 
Um, and uh, also Katerina Pastor, your comments about, you know, isn't it so interesting that um, a system which is so coded in law resists legal governance? Um, so why, why is that? I, I, and, I, and I think there was a bit of a tension through the day, for me at least, where, you know, that idea of law as constitutive of markets, of capitalism, of the economic system, and this idea that it, 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 it is within our social control, because legal regulation is within the realm of our social control. But at the same time, there is an anxiety, I think, that we all feel that it is actually a runaway logic, which is alien and inhuman, and actually beyond social control. So why is it that we can change legal regulation, but then we wake up every day with the reality that we are subject to the market and, and to wage labor and to um, accessing all the fundamental means of life through the market? Um, is it because legal regulation has not gone far enough? Um, you know, what, what is it about uh, the, the market which is so runaway and alien to us? And I think, I think that was something that stayed with me, and I think you know, there are many different views in the room about um, you know, what is the most important target. Is it the ideology of neoliberalism? Um, and I thought that was brought out very well by Matthew in his presentation as well about you know, the po post-war landscape and the importance of this recognition of, of neoliberalism as a sort of new, neutral terrain. We started to think about in, in putting aside the options of socialism and barbarism in the post-war period, that somehow this new ideology of markets, of the economy, was a neutral terrain, that we could embrace it as neutral because it went beyond partisan politics or any kind of politics. Um, and yet, I think there is a need to kind of name something beyond ideology, um, a, 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 a kind of true empirical reality of that of the generalized market system we do wake up in that has an inhuman uh, logic of subjecting us to wage labor, of subjecting us to a ceaseless expansion of value and wealth that is completely unconnected to human need. Um, so that was very much in the room for me yesterday. Uh, another thing that I think was very much in the room for me yesterday was you know, this tension around the point, the, the most uh, strategic point of entry and intervention, and now connecting to the day and the concrete ways in which we can contribute to movements that are on the ground, that are trying to advance, you know, this way of let's take the market under social control and put it under a social logic. Um, and, and what is the most fruitful, fruitful way to uh, advance those projects? Um, is it, you know, through the courts? Is it through uh, change of legal, re uh, legal regulation? Is it uh, through experimentation um, with new forms of decommodifying resources? Um, you know, it, I, think, I think there is also a sense of urgency, of a sense of, you know, is it, uh, should we be experimenting with new things or should we be actually utilizing the things that exist? And I heard, for example, Linda Shee point out yesterday, you know, Community land trusts, and I, I'm, I, I, I think if um, if we as partial common owners, <laughs> you know, were the owners of every penny for how many times land trusts were mentioned yesterday, we would be quite wealthy stewards. Um, <laughs> so, because really, um, you know, I think people are really looking to the land trust as a potential way to decommodify land and housing. But she pointed out. There's only 10,000 units of housing under community land trust ownership. I mean, in in, uh, in the United States, this is really a pity. I mean, I will point out that you know, based on more recent uh, census information, there will be 50,000 units, um, you know, or some, some something by the end of it. But, but nonetheless, right? In comparison to a million units of public housing that exists, in comparison to the great housing need that we know exists, it it is really minuscule. So so. Should we be focusing on the low-hanging fruit? Should we be focusing on uh, and, uh, institutional exper experimentation with legal institutional design through existing legal institutions like the Community Land Trust? Should we put all of our resources towards that? Or is it that we need something entirely new? Um, and I think from myself, as a legal academic who decided to <laughs> become an executive director of a small uh, uh, land trust, which luckily 
We got $20 million last year from Mackenzie Scott, so that's going to help us a lot in our experimentation. Um, but nonetheless, as someone who abandoned that um, path and came to this path, I've, I'm, I'm really heartened by the idea of using existing legal institutions because I also, as a lawyer and policymaker, someone who spent time trying to think about how do we change policies to make the um, landscape for land trusts better, um, it, it, it tr there's still a lot of uh, barriers to land trusts succeeding in the state of California, in the United States, but these are very concrete things that we can intervene in um, and we can try to make change if we focus on together. Thank you. Um, I'm going to shift us because I feel like the. <laughs> <laughs> uh, if you don't, you can you can. I'll just, be quick. Oh, okay. I understand okay. you want to make a conversation. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, Smiley's points resonate. That a lot of the property rights conversation is about power. Uh, what existed before the rise of neoliberalism? Oppression. So it's not new. Um, a question we could be asking is why? What, what were the conditions and mechanisms that led to this paradigm with an emphasis on property rights as the fair, uh, equitable, distribute, efficient, colorblind um, d distribution and mechanism of achieving justice? You know, a lot of the conversation we talked about uh, some of the rhetoric around freedom that was grounded in property right. Um, but, you know, we can point out that there was an evolution of, before this system, uh, more outright examples of violence and oppression to more implicit mechanisms of violence and oppression from use of state-sanctioned violence, uh, of even debt, use of debt, coercion through debt. Uh, going back to the point of power, is an illusion of choice that's put forth in the domain of property rights. Choice is emphasized, but it's almost a straw man illusion of choice. Um, and then, you know, conversations about uh, the U.S. government in geopolitical terms reacting to communism and fascism, uh, perhaps, but was it also a mechanism to basically hoard resources amongst the capitalist class? You know, we, we spent a lot of time talking about some of the hypocrisy of property rights. We spent a lot of time talking about ways in which the state intervenes on behalf of the capital class, uh, even when uh, the rules and structures are not in their benefit, so as to benefit them. We can look at examples of history when, you know, I, I have a frame of race sometimes in the United States, when black people have been able to acquire capital, been able to acquire property, it has never received the political codification to protect that property from terror, theft, uh, and other forms of malfeasance. And this is not limited to black people. Uh, but, you know, here's where I think we, I would have liked us to spend more, more time. The inseparability, like we were clear that government and capital and economic systems were intertwined. There were lots of examples. Uh, but not a lot of points about the role that identity stratification has played in that relationship. Margaret talked some about it, but uh, in earnest, how is it that uh, all these forms of interventions, whether in the, in, the, in the nomenclature of property rights or outright state uh, theft take or, or taking structures in a way to benefit one class, how does that happen when you have dominant political groups that uh, don't benefit from a structure like that. That's where race or some other form of identity group stratification comes into play. It is the offering of relative status by which, say in the case of the United States, white people can go along with a system called property rights or whatever you call it, uh, by which a group of elites is able to accumulate in perpetuity. Th that I think we, we, we need to play. So I'll, I'll say one, Last whole thing, and then I'll pass Mike, which is uh, any analyses we do that don't take account of the ways in which people are divided into groups and those groups are afforded different elements of power and control is limited, short-sighted, and frankly will only lead to a temporary solution that will not be long-lasting because the ability to come, come in and coerce 
structures by offering some groups relative status against another will always exist. You can hold on. That's the microphone. Thank you, Derek. Thank you, all of you. Um, I really appreciate the to, to identify the strategic questions of how to move forward and also the strategic considerations of what we have to weigh quite seriously in any steps forward. Uh, Derek, um, I followed your work uh, staying with this theme of ideas into action around baby bonds, which was really a, a glimmer in some scholars' eyes, right? But then suddenly was uh, turbocharged into the national conversation through the work that you uh, led um, on advocating for this policy um, through the Democratic primaries uh, process. Uh, and I feel like there's so many lessons of what it takes to convert ideas into action and to consider and weigh these real life heavy questions of these important first steps of how ideas become action. So what are, the, what are some of the lessons or the pitfalls in your experience, uh, and then I'll turn to others around uh, what it takes to convert an idea into action? Thank you. Uh, first, commitment, right? So the, the, you're right, I used to get ridiculed, laughed at, uh, but you commit to what's right. Uh, you never know when, the, when that Overton moment occurs and an idea that you've been ideating for a long time has a chance to, to make it. Uh, pessimists, you know, reporters would ask the question, yeah, okay, give us something that can really happen. <laughs> Uh, well, you don't know. You have no idea. Uh, what, what we did in the last pandemic was tremendous, and that story hasn't been written. However, you know, there was a lot of despair, a lot of unnecessary deaths, but we frankly implemented a federal job guarantee through the PPP program. We frankly did guaranteed income with those stimulus checks. We frankly offered uh, guaranteed health care uh, during periods in certain localities during COVID. We frankly had a moratorium on evictions, foreclosures. We did all the things. We did them. Uh, obviously, it wasn't sustained. Obviously, it was inadequate. But it was unprecedented. And if you look at what we did in relation to the Great Recession and compare the outcomes from both of those things, uh, you'll see that this, this isn't simply about uh, charitable economic security, but these are investments. These are productive investments that are not only helping the people in a direct way, uh, but are good for our economy. So, but to answer your question, uh, you know, I'll say one, being ready. Uh, the solutions aren't that hard. Start with the problem. With, with regards to wealth inequality, the source of wealth inequality is wealth begins more wealth, and those that have wealth have some capital foundation that puts them in an asset that passively appreciates over their life. So then the solution is, how do you ensure everybody has that capital foundation so they can get in an asset that will appreciate over their life? So um, stay ready. Um, and then here's a the point I want to make. There is no silver bullet issue that's going to solve the problem. I get a lot of credit for baby bonds, but that's not our salvation. We need to have a North Star vision of justice and do a paradigm change such that when we come up with any of our issues, we're not competing with each other and we're not on the defensive, but rather that's the common sense logic. Right now, anything that's framed in property rights uh, need not have an explainer. That is the default of something that's good. So uh, we need to change narratives in a way that we can have these policies that can uh, lead to our salvation. Yeah, I appreciate that. I want to highlight the point about the kind of common sense. You say property rights, a number of associations come up that just make it natural, right? And um, uh, taking into account one of the things that I admire about baby bonds, besides the very kind of real politic understanding of how to navigate political discourse and the political agenda setting process, was also that it was real politic in terms of naming itself baby bonds. Yeah. It is a very <laughs> sweet name that is a very important counter to the uh, kind of uh, restrictive bills on women's right to choose that in many states were called heartbeat bills, 
that I thought the naming of those bills was very clever. Yeah. And you were claiming this ground, and baby bonds was a way to push back and say, like, actually, we own this ground of investing in the future through our young people. You no, know, real quick, I know others are on the panel, but uh, that's exactly right. I'm trying to win. So there was strategy, right? It, it was, it was, how can you say a baby is deserving or undeserving, right? Obviously, the alliteration, but that was the idea, right? It came out of knowledge from uh, which the most parsimonious ap approach to address the racial wealth gap? Reparations. Um, what, what's some of the other logic that we learned? Well, people like Michael Sheratton and others created uh, a clarity that we need to get beyond income and think about asset security. Uh, but it was also obvious that the problem wasn't savings. Uh, we, we know that black people with similar incomes as white people, if anything, save more in active terms. We know that passive savings is a mechanism by which wealth is generated. So that, that's the way the idea I ideated. And then one other quick thing, Lynn Paramore wrote, wrote an article about baby bonds. It said, an idea a conservative should love. So they're hypocritical if they don't like baby bonds. Baby bonds is not necessarily not a market framework. It is saying that, again, providing that critical ingredient of capital as a birthright, as an economic right, that, that's the idea of the purpose. Thank you, Derek. Saki, Smiley, anything you want to add in terms of pitfalls, lessons that folks should be thinking about today? I, I don't have a, a ton to add. What I want to say, uh, in agreement with what Derek has shared, is just a slightly shift in the frame. Um, because and I and I was joking around in our last uh, in our last workshop with and I wrote down names if you see me looking at notes just to think I'm making sure I reference people right. Like Shin Chinasha and Eli is that the workshop I was in? Okay, did I get it right? Okay, <laughs> all right. Uh, I think I made a joke something along the lines of um, uh, the best capitalists are socialists, right? Because I always have a monopoly in my house. Uh, <laughs> Just to say, uh, and so, but part of part of this, and I think this is an example of Derek's point. Part of how we get over a lot of our pitfall falls is start trying to just be right all the time, and actually try to expose some of the hypocrisies in capital. Um, and so I think the baby bonds is a good example of that. But it's not. It's also not just about narrative it's also in some ways how we win and so when we think about um uh you mentioned this moment in in even like during this global pandemic because we also had a lot of big wins i agree like we sh we won these essential worker boards um which are standard setting boards that workers were on making decisions they weren't advisory they were making decisions uh, about lots of things that you would argue would happen either in collective bargaining or in a corporate board, and we want them in places like Houston, Texas. Um, and um, I would argue that we won those in large part because the pandemic allowed us an opportunity to change the market of how people thought about themselves. All of a sudden, they weren't low-wage workers, they were essential. Uh, when you think about essential, you think, when you think about the essential parts of a car, that's, you take care of that part of the car, you want to make, you get the oil changed, right? You go and you, the essential part of a house, you take care of that part of the house. Uh, if you think about a low wage thing, uh, you know, you can just throw that away, right? So uh, that was kind of a gift of the pandemic. And so when people are talking about workers now being on the rise and the great resignation, the great awakening, all these upsurges is because all of a sudden the, the, the market, to use the master's terms, has changed. Right? And all of a sudden, what people are hungry for and open to hearing has changed. And so um, I always like, I, I like movies and sometimes nerd movies. I don't know, some of the, we're in Silicon Valley, right? Has, has anyone seen the movie General Magic? Right? Right? I mean, it's great. It's free on YouTube. You should totally watch it. It's a lot of your nerd friends, 80s glasses, who made what I would think is the predecessor to the iPhone failed miserably. It's one of those great fail forward, forward stories. But like, you know, when you have like the right idea, but the market's not ready, I think there's something about, there's some really great lessons for us as a movement 
in that story. That's about, uh, it's not just about being right and having the right solution. And I thought about that movie last night after hearing Mark and Damon talk about the compression points and about this moment where we could actually be like getting ahead of this opportunity in AI and data, where like we could potentially, if we think about this in the framework of, of historical materialism, and this is a compression point, and here we are, like there's all this data, and who gets to own it, and how do we negotiate over it, how do we regulate it, like if, if we're at that point, right, then it's not enough just to say, you know, we gotta do something, and you know, like, right, but there's a, there's a, there's a particular way to intervene now that we couldn't have intervened 10 years ago. And like, so, so trying to make that calculation, like we couldn't have won an essential worker board in Houston in February of 2020, but we could in April of 2020, right? And so trying to be disciplined and to Derek's point strategic about those calculations and not just falling into the pitfall of wanting to be right or being perfect. Because, you know, to be honest, a lot of our victories were kind of a messy shit show under the hood. I'm just gonna be honest with you. I'll say it, this is a safe space, right? Like a lot, like we put, the stuff is pretty in Time Magazine, it is. But like, democracy is messy AF, right? But like, to like let go of some of that stuff and to like, make sure that we're striking at the right moment when the market is ready for us to strike, I think is, is the other way to get, over, get around those pitfalls. Thanks, Miley. I appreciate you naming, on the one hand, the pandemic, which is not predictable, but then on the other, AI, which is in some ways predictable. Um, we don't know how it'll break. Um, it reminds me of actually the point that Yulia made yesterday about we know somewhere between 20 and 50 million people are gonna be need to move or be displaced That's right. by 2100. How do we think about opportunities, crises uh, that are on the horizon? So that's really- and then also next. to Derek's point of having a North Star. Yes. So like being ready, because yes. if we hadn't had the failed experiments right. of trying to win wage boards in other places right. or health and safety boards right. before the pandemic, we wouldn't have thought to try. Right. If we hadn't had some of the North Stars that had come out from, say, the Clean Slate Project or some of the campaigns that we had tried before, we wouldn't have thought to try the Essential Worker Board. So, like, this idea of being clear on our values and vision now, yeah. such that when the opportunity or that compression point strikes or the market opens up for whatever reason that we can do it, yeah. like, that's the, that's the secret sauce that I felt like I wanted to align with around Derek's point. I appreciate the liberal use of compression points now I see as part it's of your vocabulary. It's very liberal. It's part of your vocabulary. I, I'm probably completely misinterpreting Mark and Eric's point right at this point. Like I'm now, yeah, now I'm going to be using compression points with my daughter. It's, it's, a, common, it's a common sense. Stone soup it's a common tonight. sense. Yeah. <laughs> um, so building on this topic of opportunities and looking kind of over at the horizon line, Saki, I wanted to ask you, um, what else should we be tracking? Political, social, ecological, technological, from your perspective? So I'm gonna stay really local because I think in some ways the only way that we can make you know, real concrete interventions is to actually focus on a specific place and time. And so I um, you know, work in California and have observed the California housing movement and the opportunities for shared equity home ownership models, and um, I think we're in a very exciting place. Um, you know, for, for the first time ever, land trusts are becoming a normal part of the sort of affordable housing toolkit. Um, you know, it, it wasn't before at all. Um, you know, so the solution was always, uh, let's look to the market, uh, supply and demand. We, we have a, a, a shortage of housing, affordable housing is in California, like everywhere. Um, we're, and especially around big metropolitan areas. And so the solution must be just build, 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 right? And that's that's really been the common sense, um, I think, for a very long time. And that has really been shifting over the last decade, especially, where people are really focused now on preservation work, which is the sort of area in which community land trusts work. And what is that? That's you know, uh, the rehabilitation acquisition of existing housing. And it's really looking at existing housing within a smaller housing stock, which is between five and 25 units, which actually makes up the majority of the housing stock in California. So 
it's about creating affordability now as opposed to a decade from now. When we build new production homes, what happens? Um, the cost of construction is so high, um, all the inputs are so high, and as a result, uh, the rents are not actually affordable for people of lower area median incomes. So it's not really creating the affordability we need now and many of those lower area median incomes. And preservation work, it's keeping people housed today. It's buying your building today, keeping it in your, you in your home today. Um, and that's really a big part of the work of Community Land Trust is this anti-displacement work. We're trying to stop people from being displaced today. In the Bay Area, we have seen the exodus of so many people of color in particular because of this uh, housing crisis. And we need to keep those people housed today in their homes, not wait for a solution that starts to work 10 years from now. So um, so that's that's exciting to see community land trust really become part of the normal affordable housing toolkit. It's also exciting to see new preservation funding coming online for the first time ever. For example, um, you know, the, the, uh, the California passed the Foreclosure Intervention Housing Preservation Program. This was a program um, to pair with SB 1079, which was advanced by Nancy Skinner to uh, address people in foreclosure situations, to be able to have a nonprofit intervene and buy their home and help them to stay housed today. Again, another solution, which is talking about how to keep people in their homes today. And those funds can be used also for units uh, between the five and 25 unit counts. So we're looking at, um, the. it was a $500 million fund. It got slashed just last month to 235 million. That's a pity. Um, but it is still a significant pot of funds, purely grants, so this is 100% subsidy, to put into the creation of new affordable units. Um, that's a really rare thing. You need subsidy to create affordable housing. There's really no way around that. And so that's an exciting uh, transformation. We're seeing also other movements towards this community ownership movement. So I think this is what we'll call it. Um, and uh, you know, and I, I, it's a broad umbrella of people who are interested in social housing, um, experimenting with uh, housing like they have in Vienna, for the first time ever, I think Californians are open to finally looking abroad. We're, we're really um, opposed, right? Sort of, it, it, it's, it's so interesting how completely resistant we are in America and in California, especially um, to looking abroad to other models. But I think the depth of the housing crisis has led people to really start to think that we really need to look beyond. Um, so, so people, uh, there were a number of different um, community-based organizations did a study trip to Vienna just last year, brought back a lot of learnings, and so the housing justice ecosystem is really a larger umbrella incorporating people who are interested in social housing, um, people who are also looking at um, climate justice work, knowing, again, that, that statistic that you brought up, which is that 20 million people will be displaced by 2100. So how can we think about that in relation to the displacement problem? And how can we potentially use funds that are coming online to do that important climate justice work? So there's been a lot of federal funding um, that's finally available for the first time to do this work. And I think there's ways in which we as land trusts and people doing preservation work to actually uh, apply for those funds. Uh, especially since the funds are also emphasizing racial equity. So um, there's been a commitment to ensure that at least 40% of those federal funds are um, you know, actually given to organizations led by people of color. And so a lot of local governments who are typically the recipients of those funds actually don't meet the qualifiers of um, the, the funding. And so for the first time, nonprofits have an opportunity where we are really truly community-based and led by people of color. Um, to apply for the, for that funding. So I think we're seeing a, a larger community ownership movement that incorporates social housing, um, people who are working around climate justice, um, people who are also um, uh, working uh, specifically in preservation and in the community land trust model. I want to lift up the important work of the California Community Land Trust Network. This is a network of all of the land trusts in the um, uh, state. And although that statistic of you know, the impact of only 10,000 units, I can say the exponential growth at which community land trusts, the number of community land trusts in the country and in the state has grown is very heartening. We're seeing all kinds of land trusts popping up everywhere. 
Um, I want to point out the important work that Steve King, who's the um, ED of Oakland Community Land Trust, has been doing for years now, working towards a fund of $100 million, um, which is uh, the Community Ownership or Community Power Fund. This is a fund which is being seeded by, uh, facilitated by the Common Council Foundation, um, the California Endowment, Chan Zuckerberg Initiative, and James Irvine Foundation have all provided seed funding for this grant so that this uh, funding can grow. Again, huge opportunities for doing the kinds of projects that we're doing. Um, I'll stop here, but there's, there's, I can name some challenges to getting to where we need to get to, but I'll stop here. Thank you. Uh, do you want to add anything on that? Okay, um, well then, in the interest of time, I'm gonna open up the format to a fishbowl. And if you're not familiar, again, it's an opportunity if you have a question or a comment to jump in. I should say in the spirit of the last comment and observing the composition here, this is a black and Asian only fishbowl. Yeah. <laughs> oh, oh, just kidding. Who knew I'm black? <laughs> we will not be displaced. Um, <laughs> But if there's greater demand, turn it into musical chairs. Um, so this is where I would welcome folks, really, of any race, uh, to, to uh, uh, have a seat with us, and toss in your comment, or ask a question. Otherwise, we can just keep our dialogue going. Please, do you want to jump in? We'll do a vote. Yeah, yeah, physically, yeah, yeah, yeah. 